right, all right, all right. Give it up for my people, my people in the house. What's up, everybody? My name is Tim Black. Welcome, welcome back to the show. As we promised, let me see. Let me, let me go on my chat section real quick. Make sure I got my people in the house. What's up, Buck? How you doing, Buck? It's okay, Buck. You're two minutes late. I'm two minutes late. All right, guys. Looks like we're good. You good to go, Buck? Buck said yes. Yes, we all good. We all perfect. Perfect. All right, folks. As I promised yesterday when I did the show, I have a special guest with us today. I'd like to jump right into it. Her name is Sunny, Sunny Johnson. She's a conservative commentator and a radio host on XM Patriot Radio, known for her outspoken and unapologetic stance on political and cultural issues. She blends conservative principles with urban reality. So Johnson's show, known as Sunny's Corner, tackles topics like race, government, education. She challenges the mainstream conservative narratives. With a, back room, with a background rooted in, rooted in activism, grassroots organizing, she aims to bridge the gap between conservative politics and the black community. Folks, my friend, Sunny Johnson, let's get her in here. There we go. <laughs> give it up for her, give it up for her. Sunny, how you doing, sister? How you doing? Welcome to the show, Sunny. A blessed and highly favored. Thank you so much for having me. Man, I'm so glad you you had time to do this. I know you got a lot going on. Where are you located, Sonny? Uh, in Virginia, Northern Virginia, right in the DMV. What? Sonny, you know we are homies. Oh, where are you? I'm in Waldorf. Maryland. Maryland, baby. to Maryland. Yeah, man. Like, like, that's where I'm at now. That's where me and wifey at now. But I've been all over the DMV. Born in D.C. Born in uh, uh, General, in D.C. General Hospital up there in Southeast. I think um, that's when my husband was born. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. And then I moved up here. So I've been up here with my husband for about 24, 25 years now. And um, yeah, so we get ready to go back home and make some noise in Richmond, Virginia. So we're looking forward to that in a new chapter. We didn't send baby girl off to school. She in college doing her thing. So now um, it, it's a real open opportunity for me to go and as we say fix where we live dope dope that's crazy my wife is from petersburg virginia yeah vcu mm -hmm. area yes yes so that is ironic man that's something to talk about later offline man but um folks i want to jump right in it sunny sunny's got a lot happening i want to make sure we get to this sunny we've been looking at the polls i know you've been looking at them i know you know what's going on with the election i know that we got other people running I am a Dr. Cornell West supporter. That's because I've been rocking with Dr. Cornell West for years before he ran. Like him running, I was surprised as anybody else, okay? He's been on my show about 10 times. So he starts running for president. Of course, I'm going to support him. But most Americans are not even aware Dr. West is running or Dr. Jill Stein. Even, even a large amount of people don't know RFK is running. So for all intents and purposes, I feel the race is coming down to Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. What are your well, feelings? All we're gonna need is a few points here or there in the specific states that um could change the whole trajectory of the election anyway. So I think it's really gonna come down to uh their technology that they have, their ability to pinpoint voters, and their um uh, ability to actually get those voters out. Um, so you know, like it stands now. I, I understand 2024 is coming. I understand it's a big presidential race. But what I'm looking at when it comes to Black America is our, our issues are local. Like our issues are happening at the local level. And yes, things like policy that inflects, uh, that uh, reflects uh, inflation, so forth, so on, foreign policy and stuff is very important at the presidential level. But if we are going to change the dynamics of what is happening in our community, that is going to be at the local level. So I would rather, I take most of my time and focus it on that because um, when you talk to a lot of black people, they say they don't vote and they don't vote because they don't think their vote will matter or they don't, they, they don't think their vote will change something. And they're telling the truth, right? Especially if you're in an area that is either dominated in red or dominated in blue with no opposition force. It doesn't matter who the president is. You're 
local air, your local level uh, politics are not going to change. And that means the circumstances and situations in those areas are not going to change. So I spend a lot more time focused on what's happening on local politics than I do in a presidential election. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So are you one of those people? Do you, do you vote or do you not vote? I vote. Yes. You vote. Okay. But you understand. I, I tell people all the time, like when I first started into politics, I did not, I was one of those people that supported voting. Uh, more so than I do now. Like I, I've more moved towards, let's say, I don't criticize anyone for choosing not to exercise their vote. I'm not one of those people that goes, you know, black people work so hard and we all die just so you could go up and Your choose. ancestors <laughs> died for you to have the right to vote. They also died for you not to vote, right? Mm -hmm. That That is literally the point that you have that choice. Um, But I encourage people to vote. Um, We only have whether you're looking at between 13, 15, 16% of the population, we must vote. And even if you do not vote at the top of the ticket, you coming out and voting bottom ticket down ballot is very important because that's going to be picking uh, the people that are going to control your judicial. Those are going to be picking the people that sit on your city council, your mayor, certain committees, certain local laws and jury, uh, uh, um juristists coming up through through local areas policy through local areas and if you're not showing up then those things are going to get passed without your influence or, where you, or without your say so even if you cannot bring yourself to vote at the top of the ticket you should still come out and vote everything um down ballot uh that that really will affect your life and also the secondary part of that is understanding if you are in an area that is either solidly blue or solidly red your turn to participate in the process is during the primary yeah. right it, it is not during the general election so if you are not participating in the primary mm -hmm. then you are only getting the candidate that they pick for you right so you have to make sure that you are participating in the primary because there are a lot of good black candidates that really want to do what is best for our communities and i'll even say this about some black democrats right they really want to do what is right but the system doesn't want them mm. so if you're not going to come out and support them in the primary then the system is going to get their candidate and then you are going to be voting for that candidate in uh in the main election in the primary election i mean and so you have to make sure that you're starting at the start point in the political process i agree for the most part i agree that there are some people that mean well it, it is a systemic issue there are systemic problems in our in our politics that regardless of what party you are affiliated with you are republican correct no no, no. You're in no, independent? No. Um, no. I I flirted with the Republican Party, so I started around Barack Obama's time, okay. um, and I was kind of really, really active within the Republican Party. So I was there to watch Trayvon, and I did not understand the conservative and Republican response. And I really, I don't know, do you curse on your show? Yeah, we do. Okay. Well, I really just thought they were bitch made right like okay. they just don't fight back like they're they're just cowards and that's why we're not seeing the situation the same way right so maybe it's just a, a way of upbringing that makes them react this way um as opposed to how we were looking at trayvon and zimmerman right okay. um but that's just me not knowing not understanding not seeing behind the curtain um by the time we got to ferguson i i was done I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I see. I see this clearly. I know what y'all are. I know what is behind this curtain. And the worst thing that y'all could have done is let me see behind the curtain because now I know what I'm fighting. So it became very, very eye opening for me during Ferguson in terms of how the Republican Party actually operates. So I just identify as a black conservative, a black conservative, not a conservative, because they are two different things. Wow. First time I've heard this. So what what's the difference, the difference between a black conservative and a, and a conservative? OK, black conservatism, we could trace our ideology back to Frederick Douglass. 
straight up through Booker T. Washington, right into yeah. Carter Woodson, on up to Malcolm X, right? We got a pathway that shows our legacy in this country. I can tell you all about Black conservatism without mentioning a single white person. That's how deep the bench goes when it comes to ideological thought in the conservative realm and Black America. This modern conservatism, it didn't spout out until the 1960s. After the civil rights fight had ended, they started to uh, refurbish themselves, repackage their ideas, and their newfangled conservatism became wrapped up in being an opposition uh, force to uh, Russia, bringing down low taxes and being what they would call free market friendly, which just actually ended up sending millions of American jobs overseas, right? That is their conservatism. It is not founded in founding principles. It's not, you know, connected to the constitution. It is not like it, it has no attachment to anything that they say it has an attachment to. It came out of a political necessity with the democratic realignment in the 1960s. This is what their realignment um, looked like. And they just called it conservatism. But it is not wrapped up in any lineage or any history or any uh, dialogue of study. If you look at the Republican Party, they go from the party of Lincoln to the party of Reagan. Right. That is literally a hundred year gap, right? right? So what the hell happened in that hundred years? And they don't want to talk about it because it's filled with them um, being apathetic. It's filled with them being weak. It's filled with them bastardizing the constitution. And for as much as they want to say uh, the Democrats started the KKK, well, you was watching them do it and you ain't stop them. So it, like the whole conversation is just something they don't want to engage with because they will be shown, um, they, they and the history of the Republican Party will be shown for what it is. And rather than just ripping the Band-Aid off and letting history stand as, as, it, as it is true, they want to continue to play this game where they can subvert words and change language and think that we're not going to be able to connect the dots ourselves. Wow. Wow, that is very interesting, man. I had, I had one view of it. Um, I, I've noticed th that would put you almost at odds with both sides of the political spectrum, and so I, I feel sort of like we're in the same boat here as a, a person who was formerly a progressive. Now I'm just Tim Black. I'm just a, I, I say the same thing. I'm just a black person who believes in certain policies. I think that would better America as a whole, but particularly the black community. That's my main focus. Has been my focus. And I just realized that the politics that I was engaged in wasn't actually working towards the benefit of my people. So that's where my split came. But I'm as critical of Democrats as I am of conservatives that adhere to what you pointed out, which is the smoke and mirrors of conservatism. Now, what you describe as Frederick Douglass, that's a different take. What you describe as Malcolm X, uh, that's Booker T. Washington. These are these are ideologies that I feel more uh, aligned with, just based on my note, my knowledge of history and in those scholars. But okay, so do you have someone <laughs> as far as in, in, in this political in this political environment that we're in? You're not aligned with the Republicans. You're not aligned with the Democrats. You're independent. You float, or you just say, you know what? I'm not going to sign up for either team. I'm not going to engage in this. I, as far as my advocacy and activism yeah. is concerned, I don't, I don't endorse, I don't push anybody to vote. I don't try to convince anybody to vote. I'm not going to have you uh, argument with you about who you are voting for. Um, I'm not going to sit and tell you who I'm voting for. And we're going to have a discussion. The discussion is going to be around policy. The discussion is going to be around what we want to see Black America look like, like what problems we know we both can say we know exist and how our solutions may differ or how our, how our solutions um, fall into commonality, right? Those are going to be the discussions I'm having. But I am not going to be I am not going to be defending any politician that does not have the best interest of Black America at the forefront of of whatever they're doing. Um, it doesn't have to be Black to the detriment of everyone else, right. but it has to be a, a highlighted portion because of what has happened to our communities at government's hand. 
right? This right. isn't us being lazy or us not wanting to build or us not wanting to grow or us not uh, having the intellectual aptitude to do so. No, this is a government that targeted us every single time we started to amass power and destroy that power, whether it be politically, economically, or education wise, it doesn't matter. It's so many different spectrums you can look at that every time black people started getting ahead, it was government that came in. And this is what I say about white supremacy. White people never beat us. You never beat us. You couldn't, not even on your best day, could you beat us? You had to use government. Mm. That was the only way you accomplished it. When left to your own devices and you had to actually compete, you lost. And, and we made you look bad while, while it was happening, right? <laughs> so it, it is no victory of white people beating us. It is always the case that they have government enforcement on their side. And that is how they're able to um, crush and steal and devour our wealth. When you say white people, who are you talking about? Are you talking about working people that random... Or are you talking about the system that exists that is run by the, when you look at that system, what you see, uh, the tone of those people that, that run that system? Th that included, um, but mm -hmm. also not just inside the system, but also inside the political structures uh, okay. where they want to create a space and this is our safe space, right? But mm -hmm. that means that we safely stay quiet in those spaces, right? They're going to protect us. They're going to be our allies. They're going to be our friends. The only cost is we shut our damn mouths. And that is, that's the dynamic we can no longer um, continue uh, to roll with, uh, especially when it comes to the right. If you're looking at um, everything that's happening today, how they're just going this anti-woke route that is actually just anti-black, but they are expecting us not to see it and not to call it out and not to have it at the forefront of our thought process. No, that that's not going to happen anymore. Y'all have had a lot of black face Republicans that have come along and played this game with you, but you have met a generation that is not interested in playing. And when I came in, I was one of, I was basically by myself because all the other black face Republicans mm -hmm. were okay playing around. They were okay being like inside the process. And I just was not. So I just got canceled from everything. I got kicked out of everything, but I was like, Hey, the policies, the, the ideology, the principles, those things don't belong to white people. True. Like I said, we got we got the legacy of it all running all through us. It don't belong to you. And if you think it belongs to you, then test your little theory about intellectual overpowerment and come and take it from you. you mm -hmm. it, it ain't going to happen. So that's what we're looking at now is having an understanding that these things don't belong to you and you're a coward. So I'm looking at a coward trying to take what is mine by legacy and right. And I'm like, okay, this is what you want to do. Let's have this fight. So that's where we are right now. They want to fight. They want to be anti-black. Then I want to show them what black intellectual excellence looks like. And let's see how that matches up. And all they do is run, right? They don't want to talk to someone that can be their equal and match them in an intellectual debate. No, they want people to do a uh, regurgitation of stereotypes and talking points so they can rah, rah, rah and get their tingle up their leg instead of actually, actually being challenged and pushed back. So I am one of those people that just started pushing back. And over the last couple of years, we have seen those numbers start to grow as more and people, as more and more people understand that um, these people are cowards. They can be beaten. There is no need to run from them. Um, they don't read. They don't study. They, you know what I'm saying? They right. really just regurgitate. They are the sheep that they think that that they want to mm -hmm. call everybody else. So if you know that is the case, why would we run from them? What do you think about what's happening now with the demographics as far as they say that Trump is on the verge of pulling more votes from black America than any other president on the Republican running for the Republican nomination? I'm assuming he's already got the nomination. Any Republican in recent history, do you think there will be a political realignment? Do you think that black America that usually votes 90 to 95 percent for the Democratic Party, this, this is an opportunity that they may, we may divest from the Democratic Party. Is this so 
a proprietor of our politics? This is Donald Trump's third opportunity to do this. This is his third opportunity to do this. So in 2016, he had the opportunity to do this. When he came down that escalator and he gave his speech announcing he was president, me and my husband were watching and we were laughing, right? Because come on, it's Trump. Nobody, come on, right? Get serious, right? This is not going to happen. Um, but he comes down the escalator, he starts speaking and he goes, I'm rich. I'm really, 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 really rich. And I want to make America rich too. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you keep talking like that and you're going to get black voters. Yeah. You're going to pull black people because that's the kind of conversation that black America would be willing to engage you in, a capitalistic conversation. Um, and of course, that's not where they went. They went Omarosa and you need to kiss the ring and and having the pastors all around with their hands on them laying saints. And I was like, OK, this is what y'all are going to do. This is all for show. This is all photo ops. None of this is substance. Right. None of this is an actual plan or actual policy. So the entire four years from 2016 to uh, 2020, they had the opportunity to build something real. And I don't necessarily blame this on Trump outside of he picked these people. But um, if you look at the people that were there, they had every opportunity to build something real, right? Whether you're looking at <clears throat> Katrina Pearson and all of the people that were mm -hmm. actually in the system itself, they had his ear. They had his blessing that, you know what I'm saying? If they right. wanted to build something real, if they were honest, if they weren't counterfeit, if they weren't frauds, they could have built something real, but they did it. And knowing that they weren't building anything, the GOP does what it always does. And it outsourced its outreach and it gave its outreach to candy. So Candy started Blexit and and raised all of this money. Um, and what did what did it build? What did it grow? What kind of votes did it foster? And everybody will remember, or you might not remember, right before the 2020 election, Donald Trump ha held a uh, an event at the White House, and basically he wanted it to be a black event. So that. he hired Candy to bring the black people in, and no black people showed up. Right. And, and he was furious because it was such a, a, a small degenerate showing. Right. So this is what you did. You outsourced outreach. You didn't build anything. Um, it's don't even get me started about the uh, the um, the outreach centers that the GOP put out where they basically took that money, paid their friends in terms of renting the building from people that are their friends using their friend's company to set up all of the tech and all of the lettering and all of the stuff like that. And then once the money was basically exhausted, then they went to hire. So that means you can't afford to actually put somebody in there that knows what the hell they're doing because they're going to know their worth and they're not going to do it. So it, 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 it forced them to take people who were inexperienced, didn't know what the hell they were doing, didn't have any kind of connections, didn't know how the system works, and they threw them in the system. Um, what it, it was like between June and August for November election unexperienced people who don't know what the hell they're doing and they just threw them in these centers right and and then they said oh look that was outreach and then when the numbers were abysmal after the election they stopped talking about black reach a black outreach and they started talking about minority outreach because the black numbers of themselves proved how false they were it proved that they were liars. So they wanted to lump everything together. So now that's two opportunities that Donald Trump had missed to actually do something real and capture the black vote. And I didn't honestly think he would get a third chance at black people. Here we fucking are. <laughs> and this man has a third fucking chance. Hey, 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 so Sonny, Joe Biden got three chances. Right? They gave Joe. But you expect that from a Democrat. <laughs> you don't expect a Republican to get three consecutive chances back to back after mm -hmm. having fucked up the first two. 
Right? Well, that you don't expect that from a right. Republican. But but that like, that's due to the all. lack of that's due to the lack of leadership in the Republican Party. Like no one can contend with the guy. He mopped the floor with the entire field. So there but was no nothing. It has nothing to do. Black people looking at Trump has nothing to do with the Republican Party. It has exactly. absolutely nothing to do with the Republican Party. And and this is what I tried to tell Trump when I talked to him. I yeah. asked him. I said. How would you win you? How would you win you? Mm -hmm. Right? So if you were in Trump Tower and I would have come in Trump Tower and I would say, you know, your restaurant here really fucking sucks. <laughs> you know, you need to hire me and let me be your cook. What the hell do you have to lose? You would laugh me out of Trump Tower. Mm. You would not take me seriously. Yet you do that to black people and expect us to take you seriously. So think about this question and really ponder it. Wow. How would you win you? And once you come up with that answer, realize that that's what black people are looking for. Like my idea was simple, right? If you remember uh, when he was president, he sent the... Um, the propaganda video over to little Kim in North Carolina. And it was basically like, this is what your country could look like. And these are the buildings and this is the industry and your people can have all of this wealth. If you just do the right thing, this is what your North Korea could look like. And I'm like, why didn't you send that video to black America and say, you got your city tattooed on your back on your back. Now let's uh, make that equate to uh, uh, zeros in your bank account because now you actually own a portion of your city. Which one of you are going to be the first to put your name on your city skyline, just like Trump Tower is on so many cities around? Like, why why couldn't that exact same message that you thought was so vital for North Korea to hear? You don't think it's equally as vital for Black Americans to hear, especially when they are living in neighborhoods that have fallen into death, poverty, and destruction? So what if you just talk to them the same way you want to talk to the North Koreans, but you never get around to that, you know what I'm saying? Because you got to have the pastors come in and put their hands on you and pray for you. Like, Come on, man. Like, that's not what win you over. That's not what has you in this race. What has right. you in this race is your need and your desire to protect and defend your own brand. Why can you not see Black America is just like that? I get it. I do get it. I think maybe it's a lack of having, like you say, someone that can give him the information that's vital that he needs. He's kind of winging it, I guess. And, he, and, he likes people. He likes people that says nice things. He wants yeah. people around him that's going to compliment and fix his ego. And f you know what I'm saying? Right. And his his problem is he doesn't he has a decision to make and he's running fast out of time about the about the decision. The decision is, do you want a short term ego boost? Right. And that is the people that are going to say nice things about you right now in this moment, which if history tells us they're going to be talking shit about you five minutes later. But I digress. Right. Um, do you want this short, immediate ego boost right now or do you want that historical ego boost where they're going to be looking and writing about you 10, 20 years down the line about how your presidency became the focal point of switch, the focal point of change. And that's not going to be written today. That takes time to be written. Can you quell your ego to get to that? And that's the longer term win. That's the longer term victory. That's when you will be written into the history book for more than just Russia and January 6th. Mm. But can you forego your immediate ego to give that story time to be written and to breathe? And I have not seen his ability to let the momentary ego you know, that, that momentary ego always wins. Well, right now, well, yesterday, what took place, uh, I think it was in Los Angeles, where Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Bill Clinton got together for an epic fundraiser where they raised $25 million in one night. 
I think they're doing that today in New York, isn't it? I, like they're in New York right I now. Thought, I thought it already started because they said $25 million out. No, they they plugged it as it was going to be the biggest. Okay, so it's tonight. And yeah, and they and they're out there selling uh the pictures of uh, of Obama and go. uh Clinton and right. and Biden at for a hundred thousand dollars a pop. So if you want a, a picture with those three right. ex presidents, it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars a pop. Now juxtapose that. Uh, the police officer that got killed yes. up in New York City, his wake is um, today. I think they're having like a two day wake and his funeral is going to be held on Saturday. So Donald Trump is going to the police officer's wake and and Bill and uh, Joe Biden and Clinton and Barack Obama are going to be at the hundred thousand dollar fundraiser. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So like. They don't understand optics. They're not they're not paying attention to the optics and what what it looks like, especially in a place with like New York City that is experiencing so much. And I don't say that um, I don't say that as, oh, I watch the news. So um, I'm going to think that New York. I say that as a person that do not like going to New York. Right. I, I don't <laughs> like it, but I have to right to, to, to go up there and do work and stuff. I have seen in the last five, six years where New York was a place that I just didn't like to go. And now it's a place where I'm like, yo, I'm not no pocketbook, no anything. I'm stashing shit inside of pockets and making it look flat. Like it does not, it does not feel safe. It does not feel um, like a woman that can't, you know, carry in New York, I would carry normally to alleviate this fear, but I can't do it in New York. Um, yeah, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It, it takes me out of, of my safe zone. I don't feel like an American in New York because I cannot mm. defend myself. So wow. that's what it's coming. That's what it's turning into. And um, yeah, the optics of that are going to start to be very, very piercing. The more if it, the more people in that city start to feel like they cannot be safe and they are on, they do not feel like Americans who have the ability to protect and defend themselves. So we got on one hand where we have, as you pointed out, you got the Republican candidate going out there with the people want to be seen with this cop. Now look at the optics as you pointed out. I was going to bring it up, Sonny, but you got it. You ran with it. There was Guy Riviera, Rivera. Looks like maybe a black Latino who shot a, a cop on a routine traffic stop. We already know how that plays in in uh, in you know in the conservative world. We know how a certain amount of people are going to look at this. They already there's talk about immigration, migration issues. I don't know if this guy was. I, I think if he was a migrant, an undocumented person, I would have already known about it. That would have been front front and center. So that ain't the case. But as you pointed out. We have uh, this record-setting fundraiser, and that's great because in politics, whoever has the most money, who has a big award chest, 95% of the time wins. That's why when AOC won with less money against an incumbent, it was a big deal because it rarely happens. And, and she and won in the – this is what we were talking about, the primaries. <laughs> she won in the primaries. There you go. So Absolutely. once you win in the primaries in a solid blue district, then you are the candidate. You, you know what I'm saying? So again, right. circling back to the necessity to make sure you participate in the primary. Well, my thing is this. You say, okay, you, you know, you're not into these parties. You don't, you know, you, you watch local elections. That's what matters. And everybody says, you know, politics is, local politics is what politics is all about. Not about this, the circus and all this shit we see on a federal level. But my thing is, I strongly believe still, even though you mentioned all those things about Trump's failings, with the opportunities and all the bites at the apple, I do see the potential of a political realignment. I do see that now. It's yeah. not that I'm saying it's not that I'm saying that Republicans are great and all fantastic. Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 I'm no, just no. saying we need to get something for our votes, Sonny. That's I all understand, I'm saying, and I have right? said this consistently: the 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 switch that you're seeing is not a political switch in a sense of the party switch, right? Damn. It is a political switch in terms of the people. The right. people are making a choice to want something different. So it is not coming, it is not a 
top down switch that is happening. It is a bottom up. It is organic. And this is one of the things that I argue with Republicans about so much, right? I'm saying like, you think you have to come in and teach black people some shit, right? You <laughs> think you need to come in and lead us to the promised land. Like you really have bought into this bullshit lie that you are superior to us, right? You really believe that. And when the truth is you don't, We've already got to this point. We've already made this decision. We have learned these things the hard way. There is no lesson you can teach us that's going to give it to us better than what we got out the dirt. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So now it comes to us being able to take those things that we learned the hard way, the hustle we learned the hard way, the sacrifice we learned the hard way, the understanding that uh, we can't have instant gratification because that often ends up getting us in some real hot problems, right? <laughs> right. These things that we have learned, I don't like you like we start talking about this and then you got some people coming to us talking about some oh those are just symptoms of white supremacy yo fuck you those are symptoms of survival in black mm. america right those are so those are symptoms of our perseverance to get out of circumstances and situations we were born into these aren't decisions we made to put ourselves in these places we wake up one day there and have to figure out for ourselves how to get the fuck out. And no one comes to save us. No one comes to help us. We fall, we get, we fall, we get back up. We fall, we get back up until we eventually figure this shit out. Now you have a generation of us that have figured it out. And all of us who have taken that road and let, let's use one of the Republican uh, monikers, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. <laughs> now we are coming and saying, all right, we figured out the formula. How do we now take the formula, remove the systemic racism and implement this new formula that allows us to start correcting these things so our next generation isn't born into this and at the same time give some kind of economic presence today in this day and age so you don't have so many of us that are willing to kill and, and go to jail and, and, and do violence amongst each other just to escape their financial situation, right? right? right. Any kind of answer that is not moving especially black men up the economic ladder is not going to solve our crime issues it's not going to solve our family issues it's not going to solve our education issues the only thing that are going to solve those issues is if you get the hell out of black men's way and tell mm -hmm. them go get it baby let me let me see how you're going to go get it and we are providing opportunities that allows you to get it in a constructive way instead of the destructive ways that have been given to us in the decades past. But what kind of policies? What kind of policies does that, Sonny? What kind of policies are we looking at since you're a policy grounded individual? First and first and foremost, they have to be restorative policies. And, and for and secondly, they have to be done at the local level. There is no federal policy that's going to do this. And the reason there's going to be no federal policy is because every single area is going to be different. That's the way the republic works, right? Um, so you're going to have some blue areas that are in blue states that run a certain way, and you're going to have to look at what is your main goal, what is your top priority in this area, mm -hmm. and then start to target that. But then you're going to go to other areas that may be richer in resources, but doesn't actually have infrastructure. So every single place you go, it is going to be a different solution out of necessity because every single single place is facing something different. So you cannot take a plan that works in Atlanta and just transfer it to Boston and be like, hey, this going to be K. It's not going to work that way. Right. So everything has to be localized. Um, like it, oh, it, But it can be broken down into three basic spectrums, though. First and foremost, looking at the um, legislative side of things. Right. How many laws have been put into place? How are those laws either meant to criminalize us or to prevent us from flourishing in the economic uh, sector? 
going in and 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 really reducing and pulling down a lot of the legislative uh agendas that have been on the books for 100 plus years because they will go and find some nitpick in the law that has not been pressed for the last 60 years and then pull it up to use it against us today just to get their conviction so you're also, talking about so you're talking about ending mass incarceration n not necessarily no no uh, it, it, I'm talking about in this instance, uh, limiting the uh, enforcement wings interaction with the population by reducing legislation. So if you don't have so many laws on the books, then the police won't be fucking with us so much. But if you have uh, a law like uh, if, have you ever heard that saying you cannot go uh, eight minutes in the United States of America without breaking a law? Damn. Because there are so many laws. We just look at like the ones uh, that are charged more regularly. But those ones that are that are obscure, but still on the books, they still can be used to punish you. Right. So if it is you many of those. There are many all the tricks of the yeah. trade. Right. Then it's easy for them to continuously uh, catch you up. And if you're looking at this. This is a lot. Uh, this goes into how a lot of our land was stolen from us when they used obscure laws um, to be able to say this is a violation. And that that way, that means that we can come in and take your land. Right. Um, laws that would have never been uh, levied against white people were specifically levied against us. So our land can be taken. So when and and that's like a a, a, a further back uh, kind of example. But even today, if you're looking at a lot of what you you might look at, um, like the stand your ground laws, right? Okay. Um, how many Black Americans are in jail for what should have been self defense? So I want to use an extreme situation because people, if you if you play around the curtains, then and the people want to act like I'm I'm sugarfooting it. I'm not sugarfooting it. Say you have two gang members, you got blood, you got crip, right? And they hate each other. And they and they both gang members, they both banging. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is, right? Um, but the bloods are in their area, they're chilling, they're having a cookout, they got the they women, they kids out there, they out there having a good time, and the Crips come and want to shoot it up. And the bloods defend their women and children. Should that constitute a self-defense? If you're defending yourself, you're defending yourself regardless of what what affiliation you have. But that's not the way that they have written the legislation. They've written okay. the legislation that because yeah. both of you are gang affiliated, then there is no such thing as self-defense. Now, imagine how that continues the crime, the, the crime circle, right? Because if it was ruled as self-defense and they were able to just stand there with their guns and wait for the police to get there and and the other side knows that they're getting off, they're not going to even get charged, you're going to start looking at a different way of people operating in these communities because it's not everybody who's going to be a criminal. It's going to be you who initiate the violence will be criminalized, not the people that defend themselves. So they have taken away our ability to be stewards and protectors in our own communities with a lot of this legislation that they put in place that they say was meant for uh, um, to save us from ourselves, which in actuality just took a lot of black men out of positions of power to be able to control and regulate within their own communities. See, I, I tend to look at it like we got to end mass incarceration by, you know, structuring, st by building from starting from the bottom up. When we when we have schooling, for instance, we got to start with schools that actually teach our children um, as opposed to criminalize our children and, and send them into the system to begin with. I mean, if you just look at I've looked at studies that show how black children in schools are reported to the criminal authorities for the smallest things. It's sort of like prepping prepping them to go into the legal system. And, and, and I think that's where you got to start. But there are well, other when like- When we was in high school, you remember like when they were talking about like the, the black male dropout rates. Like this is, you know, back in- Right, but that's sort of like what I'm, that's what I'm describing. I'm, but here, here's the deal, right? right? The black men was dropping out because they knew it was bullshit. 
Then they knew them schools weren't teaching them what they needed to know. Uh, it was they, they knew nothing in them schools was going to get them to uh, to the economic kind of independence right. that that they that they desired. So they dropped out. They were telling America that the schools were failing, but America was like, "No, it's you." It's you and your ignorance. Yeah, it's but those schools were never ignorance. designed for us to win in the first place, Sonny. Those those schools were never never put in so place. So I'm looking at why are we send, why would we want to send our kids back to these schools and get them another shot? Why would we want to do that? Why would we send our kids back to give them another uh, another crack at the apple? I'm one of the people. I'm looking at. So you're going to tell me that the economic school, the economic, uh, the education system is a is a pipeline to prison. Right, they're as it is, from, as it from, from 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 preschool on up, they're gonna take your babies, they're gonna educate your babies, and get your babies ready for prison. That's what's why happening. Would, why would we send our that's, kids there? That's so why parents. parents now have to be, we're looking at parents have to be involved with their children. Have to understand how those systems work. Now, Umar talks about this all the time. How how those teachers, what those teachers are doing with your children. Why, why do we have to understand? We don't have to understand. We can pull our babies out. We don't send that's our babies I'm, I'm, there. I support homeschooling right? if that's what you want and to do. I'm not, no, no, I'm not just yes. talking about homeschooling. I'm okay. talking about charter schooling. I'm oh. talking about Montessori's. I'm talking about us creating. We had our own education center. We had. We did our own education. I understand. And when that. we were controlling our own education, we had some of the highest literacy rates. Some of the high, like we we were able to educate ourselves. They come along, they tell us integration is better. We buy into it. We send them our babies and every single metric of education drops once we send them there. I don't think they deserve another crack at the apple. I don't care how many studies they do trying to explain why, when, where. I don't think that they deserve another chance. So now if you're going to be having this discussion about, um, about opening charter schools or, or reinventing education or using web three through the internet, we need to be having those conversations about how we take that technology and create our own institution and start educating our kids the way we know that they need to be educated. But again, I'm not going to sit and fight when I know what them people are doing. I know who they are. I know how they operate. Um, I didn't homeschool because me and my daughter have a very, um, you know, kind of relationship. So it wouldn't have worked out um, for our situation to do homeschooling. But when she would come home, I would be very involved in what did you learn? What did it look like? What examples did like I was very, very involved in making her talk about it so I could understand what she was learning and kind of step in when necessary right but that was me again not fully aware of just how bad everything was so now my daughter is like i'm so glad i graduated when i did mom i was like what do you mean because the high school she went to uh she was the second class in that school it, it, it was a brand new school it had just opened up charter school for STEAM, uh, which is like science, technology. STEM, STEM, yeah, yeah. No, it had STEAM because A was added into it. So it wasn't oh, okay. STEM, it was STEAM. <laughs> okay. Um, and the A was art. And Ooh. my daughter's an artist. So um, so she went, yeah, so she went on, uh, in under that program. And um, it was a brand new school. Her class was the second class in. And she just graduated uh, two years ago. She's in college now. Um, but she's like, Every weekend they have a shooting at the school now. They've shut down all events. They don't all, like, and this is brand new, open charter school, multi-million dollar school with neighborhood pools inside and, and huge facilities. Like you would, like they have recording studios in the school. They have a full amphitheater in the school. And they still can't stop the violence. They still can't stop, um, the, uh, you know what I'm saying? The, the right. issues from occurring that are happening in even some of the poorest schools around the country, right? So I think it is about time for us to maybe look at the fact that in, in all things, integration might not have been the best thing. Wow. And us kind of reimagining 
what black institutions should look like. And this isn't like on some segregationists. Yo, the Jews got their own schools. The Hindus got their own school. Like if everybody <laughs> is, if, if it's all good for everybody else to have their own, why is it a problem when we're like that same thing needs to be? happen to us we need to take advantage of that and then as soon as you start talking about it they're like oh that's because white people want to i'm sorry were we not just having a conversation about educating our babies what the fuck are you bringing up white people for because you talking about them is not going to help us better educate our babies so how are we going to do that what does that look like and when you're starting to see all of these uh, exemplary charter schools popping up all, all over the country. And you see Black Americans' desperation to get their kids in these schools. So they have these waiting lists. And there's like 15,000, um, 1,500 names on the waiting list mm -hmm. of people that are trying to get their kid in a school that has 200 slots. You know what I'm saying? So the right. desire is there. The right. want is there. But us who are in the kind of the uh, intellectual ideological policy square, we're not saying, okay, well, this is what our network will look like when we start building our schools. How can we connect the schools that are already in operating in operation and then start plugging new schools in um, where they are necessary, where needs are being met, whether that be in very rural areas where they don't have access or whether it be in more urban areas where the number ratio is like 35 kids to one teacher how are you going to learn in that situational scenario right um and and, and white people learning not to be racist is not going to change 35 to one in a classroom absolutely so, not. Right. like we have to take that seriously and understand we have to be the leaders in this. We have to think differently. We have to decide that we want to reshape. We want to rethink. We want to innovate. We got new technology. We got new ways of operating, new ways of teaching. We, uh, How can we implement AI to make this a, a, a easy transference? How are we getting a secondary education, a higher education, a college level education to our kids without putting them $100,000 in debt. Right. Like, this is our time to be innovative, right? This is our time to be creative. This is our time to design and impact and change and move. And it's not, and it's like, everybody wants to cry and revolution, revolution, let's be revolution. Nah, I don't want to be revolutionary. I want a renaissance. I want a rebirth. Because we've already done it before. We've already controlled all of these things before. We've already built all of these things before. And, uh, and again, last time, we did not understand the necessity of having political protection for what we were building. But guess what? We learned that motherfucking lesson the hard way. So coming up, we will not be neglecting the need to have the political apparatus in place that protects our institutions. And, and now feasibly, we understand how to do that. And so that is looking at making sure you got people on your um your planning commissions, you got people on your development commission, so they're not gentrifying us out of our areas. You like it, it is strategic places within government, especially at the local level. That if you implement your people in those spaces, what you would allow, what what you would be able to do with not even extra money being allocated what you would be able to do with the money that is already allocated if you just started to move it around into places you think would more, be more beneficial. So if you're thinking about a federal budget that comes out, right, and, and less than 3 to 4% of it is really like, fungible, where it can actually be moved around. The vast majority of all of that money is static. It's continuously. It always comes in. But right now, it's coming into the same places that we call systemic racism. And we're not stopping it from coming in. We want to go and say, hey, how about you give us more? And then when more comes in, it goes into them. It doesn't get to us. It never filters down. It never improves. It never fixes. But we continuously get this increase of spending, but none of it manifests itself in our communities in any kind of real um, fungible way. And just with basic tweaks 
at the local level with budgets that are already written and money that is already coming in from um, programs that have already been established. If you start to use that money differently, then the things we would be able to build just with what is already on the books, we could change entire communities for entire generations. Let, the other night, yesterday I did a show and I talked about <clears throat> some very specific changes that could be happening on the local level, but I could say also the federal level, it could be implemented. So everyone knows about Marion Burry and they know about his notoriously what he was caught doing in a hotel with a woman and somehow, somehow there was a camera there. So everyone knows that story. <laughs> what a lot of people oh, don't wow. know, what a lot of people don't know is why Marion Burry was the man for life. One of those reasons was while I was living in Maryland, my friends who lived in DC and my cousins, they had summer school programs. We didn't have those in Maryland. Um, he created a middle class. He created a pipeline for single moms to get their to get their education uh, through through the uh, through government jobs. So he set up programs that took women who just who were either had GEDs or high school diplomas and put them in programs within the DC uh, in the federal I guess the, in the DC government. So he created stepping stones for them to be able to do that under his tenure. Another thing he did was he allocated a certain amount of the budget and said, well, 20% of these DC government contracts are gonna be set aside for black small businesses. These are things that he fundamentally did, tangible things that he did that changed DC forever. So when these candidates are running, when, we, when I hear Joe Biden talk, I hear other people talk, and I don't hear tangible like programs, that I know will make a direct impact to just speak to the point that you were bringing up. I think everything goes back to economics. We have to start looking for that type of fundamental real change, real policy that will make a major difference. I agree with the schools, but it's not just if we got black schools or white schools. Hell, as segregated as many of these cities are, Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in the country. That doesn't change, what you, as you pointed to, what's going on in those public schools. So yeah, it's, it's not it's just not gonna change the numbers and the yeah, it's not just it's not just the colors of the teachers and of the administrators or the students, it's the mentality and it's the budget. It, maybe there is a lot of money going into education. But like like this is what right? I mean. I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. Um mm -hmm. You could have, uh, there could be some black, some all black schools that I would not send my daughter to because I don't believe in the ideology. So it's not, it's not necessarily based on the color, right? But it is based on us understanding that what is currently in place is not working. It has failed our babies. I don't care about the other babies at this moment during yeah, this discussion. I'm not talking about, about the other babies. About. I'm talking about black babies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what that and that's what that's that, but that's all that's all I'm saying. So it's not even a dynamic. If your baby is talented in the sciences and it makes sense for you to send your baby to a more um diverse school because that fits in with their intellectual lock. That's fine with me as long as you are sending your baby somewhere where they are going to get the kind of education that is going to allow them to take their place as an American citizen when they get uh, when they, when they grow up. Right. So it, it, that's what I mean by saying it's not necessarily uh, just based on race. It, it, it is based on commonality. It is based on ideology. Like I, I want to send my kid to a school that prays. You might not like that. Right. Um, so now we have options where it's not, okay, there's no prayer whatsoever in any school, but these are schools where that's not pushed. And these are schools where it's more allowed, where it's more, um, celebrated and acknowledged. Um, and, and those things should not be a cause for fight in the public square. Like that gives you flexibility that gives you, uh, the, um, the, ability to look at your kid, decide what is best for them and to find the best option for them. Um, instead of just saying that because you live in this area, that these are the only options, but that, that because these are the ones that government provides for you, right? That to me becomes a problem. But also when we're looking at it and you're saying that 
um, that it is an economic uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Think about the economics and how you change those when we do run and operate our own schools. And so our black intellectuals are now able to get paid and be paid their worth, especially black men who are often not hired in the education process. Now they are having access to be able to be in their grace, be in their passion, be in their space, and also have um, employment opportunities, right? And as well as investment opportunities if we become the owners of our schools and use it as an investment mechanism same we can do with every other institution that we have and so a lot of these like if you look at the jewish schools and the way that they're set up they are investment centers and a lot of that investment that they make off of their schools they then give that money to the colleges and the colleges accept their kids in and, and it becomes a, a evolving way for them to make sure the economics and the long-term situation of their community, they have their needs met. Now, maybe that wouldn't be the exact formula that works for us, but are we not smart enough and, and have enough innovation in us to create a system that does work, that allows us to create not only a better education for our kids, but to also provide yeah. some economic opportunities in that field okay, so my, everything is not just run and controlled by government sources? See, my thing is this. When you say you... So the last 15 or 20 minutes you've been talking, I guess you're advocating for charter schools. I didn't know that's what our conversation was going to be, but oh no, it, yeah. like it's it's that's not necessary. It's no, not, no, no, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Stay there. So, so okay, let's say that's what we're talking about. Um, I think that the I think the reason why people want charter schools, obviously, they want better educational opportunities for their children. They want safer environments. They may want different curriculums. Um, th those who want safer environments and their concern, as you brought up, there was violence at your daughter's school. I think that is a that is a symptom of an economic challenge is happening to the area. Basically, when I hear violence, the first thing I think is money. I think finances because happy people and people that come from happy homes tend not to. And I, and I know there are outliers and there are people who have you know mental issues and dysfunction. I get that. But all things being equal, most people who are doing well don't do bad to others. Most people who, are, who have their, their means met, their ends meeting, when the ends meet, there's less stress. This, is, this a, specific school that we're talking about. No, I'm built, not, I don't, I don't want yeah, to talk. No, about but you. I'm just saying they built the they built the school specifically for okay. the rich area. It is the kind of affluent area that okay. the school is in. So it's not a wealth uh, well, not, problem in the, in this day and age. Okay, well, it, it really is no accountability. They okay. they don't hold their kids accountable. My, my point is this, money. Sonny, Sonny, Sonny. My point is this. I think once we start changing the economic condition of the parents in those environments, that will also impact the, stu the students who are in those schools. Because I don't think those children who act out in these schools, that are underperforming in these schools, are having the access to all the resources that they need. And I think that's also their parents not having the access to what they themselves also need. Right? You know what I'm saying? To create. But the parents came from these same schools. The, the schools, the schools failed the parents. Now they have the kids. Economics, Sonny. I'm talking about economics need to change. One of the ways that we change the economic vi viability of those families is through community college or school assistance or uh, 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 trade schools or ability to start businesses. These are things that change the livelihoods, the opportunities of the parents. We can't go back in time and make it better for the parents but we can't change the current situation that is happening for those parents so that they, so that they can have better home environments. So I think we have to do a couple of things. One would be I advocate for community, free uh, community college. It doesn't have to be college. It could be vocational training, schooling, because a lot of those parents, they get a chance to get better jobs, better careers, or start businesses due to finances. Everybody don't want to go into debt. Everybody can afford to go into debt. You brought up how some people left school because they didn't see a monetary gain in their form. They did not see a pathway out of the struggle by staying in that school. My dad, who worked construction, was like, hey, if you ain't going to go to school, you can come to work with me. We work in construction. You come to work with me. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. Let me go learn these computers. So I understand the economics behind that. So I think there are policies that we can implement that would make a, a change to the environments of those school children and, and better those schools. And, and yes, that's just one way to do it. 
I think the I think the parents having the ability to earn more money would assist that. And those are not things that I'm hearing either president, I'm not hearing people running on these types of platforms that include these types of changes. What do you say to that? Um, I, I would say that like I want to I want to be complete, I want to be honest about it, right? A lot yeah. of people uh are still in survival mode right they're in survival mode they're not in thrive mode they're not in flourish mode they're in survival mode and if you've ever been in survival mode you're not thinking about community college you're not thinking about trade school you're not like you're not thinking about these things as alternatives to get you from where you are and you should be right, right. you should be looking at developing a new skill you should be looking at having some kind of new opportunity or new access to get you. But survival mode does not allow for that. Like it doesn't allow for you to think I can, and, and some people will be different, right? We got our diamonds in the rough that are in survival. I was a diamond in the rough, right? I was in survival mode. I got my ass up out, right? So I'm not discrediting that, but I know a lot of people that I left right back there you know what i'm saying and okay. they didn't move they couldn't see they didn't want like wale like wale was saying when you when 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 you saw me going up why didn't you see the stairs right you saw what i was doing you saw how i started looking at education you saw how i pr prioritized marriage you saw how i like you understood the pathway that i took but you didn't want to take that pathway right and that's fine. That's your ability. To just, uh, that's your uh, right to choose. But for a lot of people now that are kind of in that space, they're not going to want to go back and relearn, rethink, reconfigure. But they're already hustlers at heart. So now it becomes, OK, how do we take the skills that you have and mirror them with someone that is already building? So you are a good organizer. You are a good, um, you can get on the phone and, and, and get people chopping and make people show up. So now this person over here has a business. So we're going to get you into that business where you're going to be able to learn from the ground up. When you start talking about those kind of opportunities, then I think that you start having a different conversation because all they're thinking is, I can use my hustle skills to do this. It's not a matter of a new education. It's not a matter of learning something different. It's a matter of me taking what I already know and using it to be applicable in the workforce in a sufficient way. So like I have a friend of mine who basically can do anything with numbers, right? You can give him an equation and, and, and tell him to switch it, uh, switch it to yen, convert it to yen. And he will be, he will do it in his head. Because he's that good with numbers. Okay. But he does not understand how that skill translates into the workforce and what he would actually be able to do if he understood that what he was doing with those numbers was an actual skill. So this is where I am. You already have, you're looking at a black community that continuously builds and creates new industry, uh, new jobs, new businesses, right? But if you look at the majority of these businesses, they don't have any employees. It's basically a one person show trying to manage, take care of, you know, do everything. And that's a lot, uh, a really big reason why these companies don't grow exponentially. It's not just that they don't have access to resources they also don't have the help to be able to but that's resources work out. that's resources no it's, yeah it's not, it is it's not, i would it's hire more people if, I had, if I had the money i would hire if i had the money i would hire more people no not 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 necessarily if you don't understand i'm a small business owner sonny if i had the money i would hire more people that's not why if you don't how long you've been doing this for a while I, okay, so take me so I, since we don't want to use you. Um, you can go by the you, you can take me, right? Okay. Um, starting everything, coming into politics and, and, and having contracts throw, thrown at you, right? Having um, speaker fees, having like all this other shit thrown at you in financial. I didn't understand that to understand the idea of hiring a manager and hiring a this. And it wasn't that I didn't have the money. 
I just didn't understand the necessity. You know what I'm saying? Because I was so new to it. I didn't have mentors. Black Republicans suck as, as fucking mentors, right? They don't actually teach you anything or show you anything or guide you in any way, right? So I, I was basically thrown out in the water trying to figure out how to do it myself, yeah. right? Now yeah. I, I relate to that. Yeah. But now I understand hiring a, a manager having an assistant like now but then it wasn't a problem of the money i had the money if if i was smart i would have outsourced those positions saved myself so much stress and prevented myself from making a whole bunch of mistakes right, right, right. but i did not even understand the necessity of it and this is what i am talking about the difference when you're thinking about people who are in survival mode not people who are thriving or people who have made it out, but people who are just like holding on for dear life. There are certain parts of the picture that are not necessarily very clear to us in our uh, in our survival mode. And being able to take people like that and say, OK, you have this skill so you can walk into a room. It doesn't matter who's in that room. You can network, you can do this, you can do that. So we're going to be looking at you to do this for us. So you're going to travel with us. You're going to go and you're going to talk to everybody on Radio Row. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to give them our card. You're going to set up the time. That's a skill. Once you understand that skill and you master that skill, that's not a college skill. Like you don't have to go to community college or trade school or something like that to have that skill. There are people that have that natural. It's called soft skills. Yeah, there's people with now, soft skills. Right. Let's take them then there's skills. accounting. There's accounting. There's bookkeeping. There's let's computer, take them skills. Like, let's a... take them skills that <laughs> black people in the hood have in spades what? and actually connect them to the business owners that don't even understand that they could be scalable by by now if they had certain people in certain places that were able. So to what you talking about? Economic growth, ownership, you, equity. Sonny, you tripping. Sonny, you mean to tell me you think it's a bunch of people in the hood who got all these soft skills? Most definitely. How would we, how would we, what are they doing now? Most definitely. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are, They're using their skills. They're just not using them for very creative purposes. They're so finding You don't think those people will go to, you don't think that they will go to community college? You don't think they will go to nursing? You don't think they would, and when I say college, community college is not, a four-year degree in political science. Like, it can be a very focused... It can I'll be just say it for my point. I didn't... I, did, I didn't go to... I didn't go to college. Well, I graduated, out of, college. I graduated out of... I graduated out of high school at 16. Okay. Went straight right. to the streets. Okay. Fucked around okay. in the streets for a couple of years. Realized okay. I, this is not the life I want for me. Okay. Got out. Uh, married my husband. Became a mother. Stay at home. And then once my daughter got of age that she didn't need me so much, I began to teach myself. I started to study for myself. I started to write for myself. I got my, you know what I'm saying? I started doing these things for myself because, but, but at that point I'm out of survival mode, right? Now I can, like, I, I had this conversation um, with my cousin and, and this was me after I had my daughter and I was kind of going through like a depression phase. Right. And my cousin asked me, she said, what would you, what do you want to do? If it was one thing you could do, no question, just, just pull it out. What, what would you do? And I told her I wanted to be a writer okay. and she laughed at me and she was like, you can't make no money off of writing. And I looked at her and I said, well, you don't understand how well I write. You don't understand how well I think. Right. So I saw it as a challenge. Did that make me go back to college? No, it made me go to the internet and start a blog that I ran controlled and were able to put out content. And all the doors came after that, right? I so think you hung that's up on the, what, that's what yeah. I mean. I think so you I'm hung not, up on the term college when it just means education. Like, you know, I yeah. wouldn't got to, yeah, yeah. You, it, but it's a, it's a lot it just of ways to learning you stuff. education when not yeah, it's out, a lot of not ways to do that. To to a lot of us, a lot of us go take classes while we work. Like, for instance, my thing is this. I think that young people need to have a goal 
they just can't leave high school. You know, black community is too many young people in the black community who, when they get out of high school, they have nowhere to go. Yeah. And I don't want them to go. I don't want them to go into armed services, right? I want them to have. Wow, rather than going to the armed services, they stay where they are. Uh, uh, I rather them go into the armed that's, services. That's the personal. Than stay where that's, they are. that's your personal opinion. You know, I, I disagree. Most I don't think. I don't think the armed definitely. services. I don't think. So I young. come from. I come from a okay. family of veterans. So my okay. my entire family served. Okay. So well, I, well, I well, what, what America's what America's armed services is doing and has been doing. It's not something I think that children, young people should. A lot of young people wanted to go to school, end up joining the services, ended up in Afghanistan, ended up. You know, I, I don't. I don't think that's the trajectory for everybody. But what I'm trying to say is, I think our young people need an opportunity. They need to be able to see a pathway, and having to say, well, after but high see, school, okay, I can go do X, Y, Z. is it's important. It's that. important for them to be able to, but to even see that. an opportunity for themselves where they can be applicable to a field that they may want to get into. But it's this not, every, but it's this not, not saying that. It's not so, going to fit everyone, Sonny. It's not for everybody. If you are naturally, if you can sing, if you can paint, if you can write, maybe this is not for you. You know what I'm saying? It's not for everyone. Okay, if you are just born with the gift of gab like Sonny Johnson and you have these natural abilities without any training, that's fine. But for other people who may not be so gifted as yourself, they may need structure. They may need a syllabus. They may need a curriculum. They may need job opportunities that are presented to them after they graduate. That's what school is about. My thing is it shouldn't cost hundreds, it shouldn't cost thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for, for children or young people or older people to be able to access that. We haven't changed our education system since the fucking 40s, Sonny. Like once upon a time, there was no high school. Like, like school should be longer we anyway. We just literally had a whole conversation about reinnovating and reconfiguring and rethinking how the entire education. You didn't really have a conversation. You kind of like said a bunch of stuff, <laughs> and I didn't really, you know, you just you just said it. I, it wasn't a conversation, but I just want you to understand the way I see this. Oh no, no, no! That 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 sounds surprising to me. I I I find that uh, I find it interesting the way that that you uh. That you stated it that uh you asked me a question i answered the question and it's not a part of the conversation um but i no, i i, I, I would really working. love what what part of the things that i said uh i guess made you feel like you wanted to interrupt or disrupt or stop no you were just in a conversation just, where okay, you didn't I, do so i would be interested in i'll that. tell you i'll tell you like when you were talking about you know the education and and it, it was like I wasn't prepared to have that conversation with you. It's like those are that's what you wanted to discuss, so we discussed it. I didn't you know, yo, I was I trying straight to explain. Where you took me. I straight no, 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 I didn't take you here. We started talking about local politics and education came up as a subject of our conversation about local oh. politics. It was not, I am not ever education heavy in terms of that being something okay. at the forefront that I discuss on a regular, right? right. Right. That's not one of my areas. The only reason it was in discussion today was because it came um, through what I thought was a very organic conversation between us, which I now realize was not. So it was completely okay. on me. For That's, I didn't mean. I didn't mean it like that. What I'm saying is, I don't. I don't really have a position on what you're what you're referring to. All I was trying to do explain why I think the community college and advanced schooling is important. I just think that the way that it is. It is a design the way that it is implemented today is ineffective and it's about money and and that's not helping our community that's my point of view on it but i didn't come prepared to have that conversation i just want you to understand where i was coming from i'm not saying you did anything wrong i'm just saying i wasn't prepared to really have a conversation on it because i'm not gonna bullshit like i know what i'm talking about if i no, don't we, i don't know the end of the listen i came, don't know enough about charles Lady, I don't know enough. Corner, and all we did, I didn't give you no topics. I didn't give you no I gave no you some anything. topics. I, I gave you some told, topics. I know. I just told you <laughs> we were going to have we were gonna have an organic conversation. That's just how I like. And I, that's all I thought we were doing here. Can we I talk about Candace Owens? I was diverting you from your plan. I'm it's all good. Can we talk about Candace Owens before you go? I would. I, I, hell, I would much rather <laughs> talk about charter schools. But go ahead. I don't, I'll I don't know. I, don't, I didn't prepare. Right. Like I don't have any no, information about let's, charter school. <laughs> let's get on what you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
and and I'm sure people got a lot of value out of what was just discussed. I just didn't know any questions to ask, and I just wanted you to know my position on it. Okay. So Candace Owens, she just left the Daily Caller. What is your Daily perspective Wyatt. on what's your dis? Uh, yeah, Daily Wire. What is your perspective on her departure, and do you think it will impact her influence within the conservative community? I just hope she's going back to the Democrat. I, I just hope that I just hope like to me, I think it is I'm cheering. I'm happy. Like, bye. Have a good life. Wherever you go, like if you go end up with the Democrats, I hope Biden take you back. Hey, and Cornell West want to take you, and you're gonna be sitting over there with, with, with Brother Tim. Go ahead, you can do that too. Hey, and Jill Stein take you in. Hold on. Like, Hold on, I ain't gonna let that go. Tim Black is not a, is not a Democrat. He has not voted Democrat since. Oh no, Obama. I put you with Cornell West. Tim. I put you with Cornell West. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't put you with the Democrat. All right, all right, my bad, my bad. Because it's but you know. any of y'all can take her. Any of y'all can take her as long as she ain't over here with us no more. I'm, I'm chilling with it. But I thought you said okay. She's MAGA, right? She's not. She's not. You know, she's traditional. a grifter. She's the same thing to me that she is to you. Okay. <laughs> Something else that I noticed that you, in a tweet that you put out, you brought up Blexit money. And this is something I didn't even, like, yo, I've been in this space for a long time. And I, 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 I consider myself pretty, pretty much paying attention to what's going on. I'm in the know. But I had never thought about what happens to Blexit money. Now, we hear a lot about Black Lives, Black Lives Matter money. And I've been vocal about that. And I say, hey, that organization is some garbage. Whatever happened with that money is not what the intentions were. Okay, that was a grift. We know that. It, it's sad that we have so many people that got to say, I support Black Lives Matter in theory, but not the organization. That's fucked up that people have to have to you know make that you know admission in the beginning. But Blexit, you pointed out that there was a lot of money raised on Blexit. Where did that money go? Could you elaborate a little bit about your thinkings about Blexit, how it's impact, what the impact was of that? And was that a grift? That was definitely a grip. Uh, that that was a money making scheme. Um, it's something that I talk about continuously because one of the things I like to do is make sure I warn any black person that is considering messing with Republicans or conservatives. I like to warn them about what it is they're walking into, um, and that's basically what they do. So what happens is with Blexit, they'll come in and they'll be like, "Oh, I love you, so we're gonna donate X amount of money to you, so a hundred thousand dollars, right?" and for you to start this organization. And then you go, you start the organization, they tell you, okay, give yourself a $80,000 salary or a $90,000 salary, right? So wait a minute, all I have is $100,000. So if I give myself a $90,000 uh, salary, then what am, I, what am I operating with? What am I building with? Well, then that means that now you have to do more fundraising. And that's what it perpetually becomes. It be perpetually becomes a fundraiser, right? And then you have to do photo ops so that you are able to send out pictures to say, look what we did. Look at the Negroes we have. Um, and like Candace went so far to do, uh, to actually have segregated events to make everybody think that Blexit was actually working. So she literally had events where she would put the white people in the back and put the black people up front. So when the camera scanned, you saw the black people and you couldn't tell that the reason that the room was packed is because the first three rows were black people and everybody else was white. So that they literally segregated the audiences to make these photo ops, to then turn around and fundraise. And the proof is in the pudding. No one can show anything that they actually organized. Uh, the most things you can say that they organized was when they did the fundraiser for the white cop down in, in Georgia, right? What else did they fundraise for? What else, like what black initiative? Like what, what did they do? We are, it, it, it was complete grift. Uh, that money went into her park, into her pockets, probably split with TP, uh, TP USA. And it did nothing for the black community, nothing at all. You know, that was the first time I've heard anybody speak at length about Blexit. And uh, I'm just astonished that, that that is the way. Is this something, because you, you, you said that you've also done some, some speaking, you've done some 
uh, some contracts, so to speak, um, within the Republican Party or for other conservatives. Is this something that's unique to Blexit, or have you seen, you don't have to oh, name no, names, no. have you seen this with other organizations? This is the way that they operate. So um, I, I experienced it myself. I, I experienced it myself, right? So um, they they offer you the money, you accept the money, they pay you, and you, you become a happy Negro. Um, they fly you out first class. They put you up in, in five-star hotels. You're eating filet mignon wrapped in bacon with uh with grilled blue cheese on top. You know what I'm saying? They right, they right. It, I, I compare it to coming to age by Jay Z and Myth Bleak. You know, I didn't came up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And right. Jay Z, I, I brought out the best of all I possess because I want you to see what it looks like. I want you to buy into this dream. That's what they do. They come. They do the coming of age on you. And they put you in these places and then you get comfortable and you get used to it. And if you want to maintain it, you know how you have to act. The funny part about me is I, I don't, that's just not my style. I don't like those hotels. I don't like that food. I don't like being the only black face in the room. So no matter how many times you try to give it to me, I would reject it because this is like, no, take me to where some, some good food is. Take me where <laughs> some real music is playing. Take me where I can see other black folks. Like you got, you got to no. this isn't the dream for me. Right. I, I will say I've had a couple of $175 Scotch shots that I wouldn't mind doing <laughs> again. You know what I'm saying? As long as somebody else is paying for it, it's right, all right, good, right. you know? I'm not too big to say I, I, I really like the really expensive scotch. That right. would be like the only thing I would want back. Um, but uh, out of everything else, just not interested. But that is what they do. That is what they use. And if you are Black and you're open to uh, interracial dating, then here you go. Now you have uh, the open pool for you to go in and try to find your spouse. And one of the most... Uh, beneficial ways for you to stay in the game mm -hmm. is to make sure that you get the appropriate spouse. So, wow. You know, one of the things that they were saying, switching back to Candace, uh, <clears throat> they were saying that how she really means well and she's, you know, she has a lot of content that she's put out that's actually beneficial to the black community. And, and the only type of content that was pushed by media was the type of content that was divisive or, or was slanderous or demeaning the black folks. Um, it, it, do you, do you, rocks. Do you, Yo, <laughs> stop trying to be revisionist. Stand 10 toes down on the shit you was talking, right? Said, no, you meant it. You said that shit with your chest. Now all of a sudden you want to walk it back? No, I, I like I would like you better if you fucking stood on what you've been standing on. If you talk your shit like you've been talking your shit. So like when you went to revolt the first time, you came back talking about, oh, it was so hostile and they were so mean to me and like crying like a little bitch. And now you want to go on this tour and have everybody treat you with kid fucking gloves. Yes, unless they break the fragile ego of this black woman, like get the fuck out of here. Um. All I'll say is she ran for me three times. So that's that's my metric of judgment, right? right. Uh, if you think I'm so easy, if you think you are so good, if you think that everything you have is organically given to you because you look out for the best interest of Black people, then dispatching me would have been easy. I it would have been easy. It would have been light work. But you ran three times. And... Charlie uh, Kirk runs and Ben Shapiro runs and all your heavyweights, all your juggernauts, all of them run. So that tells me everything I need to know about, about the people you associate with, right? And then if you see after a little, um, after her firing, she went uh, and, and did a, a thing with the Pearl Lady. So this is the woman that says women shouldn't have the right to vote. And like, like just the most batshit crazy things you can possibly imagine, especially about women in marriage and women in relationships when 
this she ain't even married and and it don't look like in no time in the future she's gonna be and that's who you are gonna go and chop it up with after you then talk to andrew tate and all, like get the fuck out of here <laughs> i'd rather you just stand 10 toes down and say yo i'm a grifter i i grift well and like i said my only hope is that she plans on doing it with democrats next and get the hell out of our arena wow you know, Sonny, talking to you really gives me hope, man. It really does. And I'm sorry that there was a misunderstanding. I, I don't think I communicated myself very effectively when I was trying to explain what I was trying to say. It got no, money. No, I, 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 didn't, I got you. I didn't I mean no diss to you at all, sister. It's me. I'm a, I, you got a I, lot I of I have conversations <laughs> that interviews, and I have this right. knack for turning it into that. But that's something I do on my show, and I, I guess I should have been more, a little bit more receptive, no, no. uh, kind of in your space. But once I was again, just trying to go with the flow of the conversation. Once again, Sonny, you give me hope because when I talk to you, I don't feel like I'm talking to a political party. I'm talking to a person who has strong viewpoints from her own perspective and from her learned experience. And that feels genuine. You know what I'm saying? And I think part of the problem with folks in the political spaces, they like, they like cape for parties, man. They cape for like the D's or the R's or whatever. And I didn't ever get, I didn't get that at all from you. I want to thank you for, for being your, you know, being, just being yourself, man, and keeping it 100. And I think the people that are watching, they're going to see that as very refreshing because I don't think they're used to seeing that. Well, I appreciate you coming on. And let's, like I said, we'll, we'll have to do this again. Now Now that we got the the, yeah, the initial birth pains out the way, uh, we come back, we'll do it again. It was a fire conversation. And I definitely want to have you back on Sunny's Corner. Uh, I don't think we get anywhere until we start having conversations with each other. So when I get a brother that wants to chop it up, I'm always going to say yes. And I appreciate you giving me the invite. Absolutely, folks. Give it up for Sonny. Go see Sonny at Sonny Johnson on Twitter. Sonny's Corner. She's on XM. You can find her. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna link them. Link them up to everything in the description box, unless you want to give them some some other details, Sonny. My uh, show, Sunny's Corner, you can catch it every single Saturday on Sirius XM Patriot, Channel 125 at 1 p.m. Eastern. And yes, if you listen today, if it, today is any indication, you will need to turn the volume down. I am loud everywhere I go. <laughs> so it's a staple. Of, it's a staple of what I do, but I got it honestly. So um, you can check me out there. Like I said, I really appreciate the conversation. I have the chance to chop it up with you. No doubt, y'all. Give it up for Sunny. Thank you, Sunny. That's what I'm talking about. Clap it up for Sunny, y'all. That was amazing, man. I, I look, look, I know what I look. I know when somebody's, you know, got their thing, and I'm just trying to hang in there with a man. What a conversation, man. What a real sister. It, it, like I said, it, it really opens my mind up to what I, I never thought about black conservatives, what that really is about. There's a guy on YouTube called the Black Conservative Pers Perspective. He ain't nothing like Sunny. What see, that's what I had in my mind. Uh, of a black conservative, him, Jesse Lee Peterson, Sonny is a totally different type of individual, man. We've talked before. I've looked at some of her content. I watched the interview between uh, with her with Hotep Jesus, and and uh, that was pretty much my only other than coming on their show briefly once. But wow, man, what a treat, man! What a different perspective, folks. Check out my sister Sonny. Um, it's not about we we don't give a shit about parties. We care about the truth. We care about sharing information and having that conversation. Keep it real. All right, my name is Tim Black. I'll see you guys on the next one. Go find me at jointimblack.com, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Oh, my bad. Comments. My bad. David's View says, one. David's View, give me a 100. I appreciate it. Tobias, Josh's programs are awesome. I don't know why you can't see the chat. The chat disappeared. I don't know. Something happened. <laughs> James Bay says, I can say that Tesla help us get reparations and Sonny can help us keep them. <laughs> Yo, J James said the conversation was fire. That's what's up, James. You need the money for education. T said it. T said it. All right, guys. That's what's up. Thank y'all for being here. I'll see you on the next one. Most news shows are suspect. They don't focus on black issues, and when they do, it's all fluff. How does that help your life? How does that help your family? How does that help the culture? They don't. The Tim Black Show is different. 
Tim Black gives you news for people who can't stand the news. Real, authentic, researched, entertaining, on point. Don't let nobody take your cornbread. Visit www.timblacktv.com today. Get black breaking news, politics, culture from someone you can trust. TimBlackTV.com. Join us today.